Great. Um, so welcome everyone. We're so pleased to have this event. We've been talking about it at Village Preservation for quite some time. Um, and we're so happy James could cover this topic for us. So my name is Leanne G. Bowley. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. And um, I want to just tell you a little bit about us before we get started. We've been documenting and celebrating and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods and really supporting small businesses. Check out our social media tour of uh, queer businesses, queer owned businesses this weekend for Pride. Um, so we host roughly 75 programs that are free and open to the public like this one. And we do that through membership and donations. So once I'm done and I turn things over to James, I'll put some links in the chat where you can find out more. And we really encourage you to find out about membership and things like like that. Um, but with that said, I would love to turn it over to James. I'm just as excited to learn like all of you. Um, and if you have any uh, questions about village preservation, feel free to put them in the chat and I can respond. And so James, thank you so much. Please take it away. You are very welcome. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is James Nevius for those of you who don't know me. And I can welcome you to Defiance in the Village, the history of the Hess Triangle, uh, with me, historian James Nevius. And if you do not know me, uh, I, I've been a New York historian for many years. I uh, have a um, number of books that my wife Michelle and I have written together, guidebooks, etc. These are the two big ones, uh, Inside the Apple, a streetwise history of New York City, or Footprints in New York, Tracing the Lives of Four Centuries of New Yorkers. And I am perhaps chagrined to note that neither of these uh, books talk about the Hess Triangle. Uh, they do talk significantly about Greenwich Village, however. So if you are a Greenwich Village aficionado or a New York City history aficionado and have not read either or both of them, uh, that, well, now's my chance to plug my work. So please check them out. I'm very, uh, we, we, Michelle and I are very pleased with both of these uh, volumes. But enough about me. Let's talk about the Hesses. So if you are at all familiar with the corner of Christopher Street and 7th Avenue South, uh, you are perhaps familiar with this little mosaic that is embedded in the ground there uh, that says property of the Hess estate, which has never been dedicated for public purpose. It is approximately 24 and a half inches on the short side of the triangle and approximately 26 and a half inches on the long side of the triangle, uh, though I will confess I have not ever taken a measuring tape myself to figure out. And if you read online, um, if you read online, we'll get into this. Uh, there is a lot of information that is true, half true, untrue, never true, completely made up uh, about the Hess Triangle. And one thing, just as a sort of seems like a little detail, um, no one seems to agree on what size it is. But this seems to be generally the consensus, about 24.5 by about 26.5. Uh, and it is in many books uh, and uh, websites and all over the place. And this is perhaps just a good summary of it. Uh, a tile triangle, about two feet on each side, is built into the sidewalk at the corner of Christopher Street and 7th Avenue South. In 1910, the family of David Hess owned a five-story apartment building not five stories. The city of New York forced him to sell his building to make room for the new subway system. That's true. The city made a mistake, however, and left the Hess family with a small triangle-shaped patch of land. A plaque remains on that spot to this day, and you can read it there yourself. So this is the basic information that you are going to run across in any book, website, etc. And what Village Preservation and Leanne have asked me to do is sort of dive and delve into this story. Uh, and uh, I've, really, I've really spent a lot of time uh, trying to track down every single thing that I could about the Hess Triangle. And I'm here to tell you that one of the reasons why you get in general this one paragraph about the Hess Triangle and not a lot more is it's hard to come up with a lot more. But what we can do today is we can talk about how this came to be, 
why it's there, who the Hesses were, uh, why it exists, and, uh, you know, sort of put it in the context of the development of Greenwich Village between, say, the 1880s uh, and the uh, 1922, uh, when this was dedicated. Uh, so here's a newspaper article from the New York Times on July 27th, 1922, letting us know the exact date that this mosaic was put in the sidewalk. Small realty parcel, private ownership inscribed in tiles, two-foot plot, um, so this was published the day after the mosaic was built. Uh, it, you know, doesn't tell you anything that I haven't already told you, except in that very last paragraph, uh, two sort of interesting pieces of information. The owner of record of this tiny leftover parcel is the D.H., it's actually D.M., Hess Estate of Philadelphia, and it has been assessed on the tax books for $100. So a little triangle of land worth $100 to the tax man. What the heck is going on here? Now, if you are not familiar with this, here's a picture of Village Cigars. Uh, let me get my laser pointer out here. So here's 7th Avenue South. Here's Christopher Street. And in tucked into this little triangle is Village Cigars. If you are unfamiliar exactly with this intersection, you can see here's Washington Square Park over here in kind of the heart of the village. Here's 6th Avenue, uh, here's 7th Avenue South, and then if we zoom in, here is our intersection of Christopher Street, 7th Avenue South, West 4th Street, and there where that little star is, is the intersection that we are talking about. So standing at that intersection is Village Cigars, and if we zoom in, you can see right at the entrance to Village Cigars is this mosaic. So let's go back and doodly doodly doo. Let's go back in time. Uh, any excuse to show the rats or map. This is New York City, 1767. We zoom in uh, onto what would become Greenwich Village. Uh, a couple of familiar, let me get a pen out here. This is about 14th Street up here. This is Greenwich Avenue, if you're familiar with the West Village. This is Stuyvesant Street. So those are the streets that currently exist, but nothing, uh, nothing of the streets that are ultimately going to make up our little funny intersection. We jump forward to 1807, uh, and this is a map of a... Uh, this was... Uh, I've talked about this maybe in the last tour I did for Village Preservation. Um, this was a, a map of a grid of New York City before the grid of New York City. So this is a, an 1807 plan. So you kind of have to ignore the stuff that's over here because that's all made up. But if we zoom in, we start to see streets that we're familiar with. Here's Christopher Street up here. This one, this next one here. I mean, we'll ha have a little arrow for you. Columbia Street uh, will ultimately get named Grove. And if that were to go through to Christopher Street, uh, there would be our intersection. So by the time you get to 1807, the streets are starting to become streets that we recognize. There's, uh, let me get a laser pointer. Uh, there's Downing Street there, still around. There's Carmine, there's Morton and Leroy. So the streets of the West Village, which in those days was the village, uh, are starting to take on their modern shape, if not their modern names. And I'm going to be doing a talk in August with Village Preservation about the kind of creation of the modern village, and we will get much more into this at that point. But uh, we have a Reason Street here, which was named after Thomas Paine's book, The Age of Reason. It ultimately gets named Bur uh, Burroughs, uh, the whole thing just goes crazy. Uh, sorry, it's Barrow. Columbia is named Burroughs. Columbia can't be named Burroughs and be next to a street named Barrows, and so they change it to Grove. So we leap forward, and now we're starting to see a village that is recognizable. Uh, this is a map from the middle of the 19th century. There's Washington Square has now been built. Grove has now been cut through, so no longer... Uh, Burroughs or Columbia, and so Grove and Christopher come together. 
boop, right there, and that gives us a uh, that gives us a little uh, or uh, insight into how that these uh, these streets finally come together. Now they're not all yet. Uh, if you look at this map carefully, labeled correctly, um, I, I love the village. I mean, I really do. But this is Barrow Street, and then obviously they called this Barrow Street. We now call that Washington Place. If you're at all familiar with this neighborhood, you know that Waverly Place comes over here and branches off into two streets, getting people all sorts of confused. But as I said, we're starting to get to 1911. And so, uh, as it said in that article that we are reading, in 1910, the city took uh, the land of this guy named David Hess, and this is the land in question. It is an apartment building called the Voorhees, and it stood at the intersection of this is West Forth, and this is Christopher and this is Grove. And it is very hard, maybe it's not hard for you, it is very hard, I find, to visualize this change. This is 1911. This is 10 years later, with 7th Avenue having been rammed through. So you go from these buildings existing, no 7th Avenue, boom, there's 7th Avenue, or perhaps a better way to show it is, there's the Voorhees, there's, Christ there's uh, Christopher, there's West Forth, and boom, that's 7th Avenue. So uh, we're going to get to why there's a 7th Avenue, it's not technically even 7th Avenue, why there's a 7th Avenue South in this area. Uh, but we're going to kind of build up to that. But the one thing you can see on this, if I take my little laser pointer, uh, do my pen, is that when 7th Avenue South was cut through, a little tiny piece of the land that they took uh, on which the Voorhees apartment building had been built did not, uh, was not in the way of 7th Avenue. It was not in the path, the projected path of this new street. So uh, that's going to become a very important part of our story. So again, here's the map. In, this is an insurance map, Sanborn Insurance Company produced these fantastic and fantastically detailed maps of New York City. So this is the 1911 map showing all the lots, all the lot numbers, uh, and there's the Voorhees. Now, uh, I spent a considerable amount of time trying to find a picture of this building. Um, what I could find was an ad for it. This is from 1904, and it is letting us know that the Voorhees is a high-class apartment house at 210 West 4th Street, the corner of Grove, Christopher, and 4th. So it's showing you that it is a, a, a building that is bounded by three streets. It has three fronts, which ensure good light. So important in this era uh, of not having central air conditioning, not having any kind of air conditioning, that good light and air mean that you're not living in darkness, you're not living in stuffy quarters. It's two minutes from 6th Avenue. Uh, the 6th Avenue Elevated Station, we'll talk about that in a minute. It's convenient to all cross-town cars, they mean horse-drawn streetcars, and it has every modern convenience, including steam heat, elevator service, the latest improved open plumbing, not 100% sure what that means, didn't look it up, newly decorated apartments of five and six rooms, each with bath, very important, You've got a private bath in your house, uh, from 480 to 600 dollars yearly. So 480 dollars yearly um, is 40 dollars a month. Uh, 40 dollars a month for a five-room apartment is eight dollars a room. That is about double what it would cost you to rent a tenement uh, downtown, which was about four dollars a room a month. So uh, this is just to sort of give you some sense of where an apartment building at the corner of Grove, Christopher, and West 4th Street stands uh, in terms of luxury. Um, now, I couldn't find any pictures of the exterior of this building. It's, we, we know it's a seven-story building, 
uh, I'll show you a newspaper article in a little bit that points out. Um, so I looked for other seven-story buildings built around the same time, just so I could try to get an idea. This is the Alamar. It's on West End Avenue at 105th Street. It's about double the size of the building, uh, double the footprint of the building we're talking about. You can see when you look at its uh, floor plan that they're much bigger apartments. The the Voorhees had four or five or five or six room apartments. The Alamar has 11 room apartments. Um, so it is a much more luxurious building. When you look at the ad for the Alamar, it talks a lot about how striking its architectural details are. And then it starts to talk about colossal fireplace, oriel window, a cold air refrigerating system doing away with the use of ice. This is a really big innovation in 1904. Uh, the Ansonia had just introduced this, and the fact that, that you could get it at the uh, Alamar means you are living in a pretty tony apartment building. Laundries, patent steam dryers, servants' baths, and bicycle room in basement. At first I thought that, you know, the servants had baths in their quarters and bicycles were in the basement, but I actually looked this up and the servants had a shared bath in the basement. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I couldn't find prices for the Alamar, but another building nearby at 410 West End Avenue was 1000 to 1250 a year, uh, which doesn't quite seem as fancy. So we've got tenements at $4 per month per room. We've got the Voorhees at $8 and up. Uh, and then you start to get up to a thousand and twelve fifty a year. And I bet the Alamar was even more. The Alamar strikes me as being a really high end apartment building. So the Voorhees sits at an interesting uh, intersection in terms of what the village would have been like at this time. Um, so this is, for example, you know it well, the Washington Arch uh, in about 19, I think this picture is about 1904, which would be the same year that that ad was put out. Uh, you're looking north up Fifth Avenue. If you crossed Washington Square to the south side, this is Bruno's Garrett, which was very famous. Uh, all these old two-story wooden buildings are, of course, long gone. Um, but I, what I find interesting about this is that it's, you know, selling ice cream and soda so it's obviously a restaurant at, at the bottom, and upstairs it talks a an exhibit of art. So it was kind of a combo restaurant art space. And, and this is the era of Greenwich Village being the absolute center of this kind of bohemian artistic movement. Um, as we head further south from Washington Square, we get um, Little Africa. This is Mineta Street and Mineta Lane. Uh, looking towards Sixth Avenue, it's the oldest African American settlement in all of New York City, is in uh, Greenwich Village, and it still had a distinct black character at the time. Go a little farther south to Thompson Street, and again, I'm trying to pick only pictures from sort of like this right before 1910 era. So these are all contemporaneous views. Uh, and by the time you get to Thompson Street, it's suddenly the home of the rag pickers which is sort of interesting. Uh, and this is another picture of Thompson Street from the exact same time um, when it was a, a, a very Italian street. You compare this drawing from, I'm trying to remember what magazine, this Collier's magazine, with this very famous picture of uh, Mulberry Street showing the Italian community. So what you've got on the south side of Washington Square is this uh, very uh, almost polyglot neighborhood where we have Italians and immigrants and the, the remnants of this African-American neighborhood all coming together on uh, the south side of the square. And on the north side of the square, there's our arch again, you start to look up Fifth Avenue and you have primo real estate. I mean, not only the row, which everyone knows uh, famously on Washington Square North, but really nice townhouses on Fifth Avenue. This is 21 Fifth Avenue, which is now gone, which is where Mark Twain lived. Uh, this is the where the Brevoort now stands. That's the Brevoort Hotel. 
which is now uh, an apartment building, takes up this entire block. You head over on West 10th Street. This is also a very nice townhouse that Mark Twain lived in. Um, Mark Twain wasn't really part of that whole boho uh, writer artist movement in Greenwich Village, but it is interesting that Greenwich Village is where he chose to live in New York City. Uh, and West 10th Street, it's interesting where he chose to live. Um, 10th Street is really what puts artistic Greenwich Village on the map because of the 10th Street studio building, which had been built by Richard Morris Hunt, who was the kind of uh, grand master of American architecture. Uh, and it had been specifically built so that there would be a studio building in which artists could live and work uh, in the same space. And it really changed American attitudes towards fine art. Uh, it can't be understated how important the 10th Street Studio building was. Well, in terms of the, the history of the village, it also can't be understated that uh, the 10th Street Studio building almost served like a magnet to bring people into Greenwich Village who were great artists, eh, not so great artists. You know, that's always true, right? Uh, so back to our Sandboard insurance map. There's Sheridan Square. Uh, this is Christopher Park. Uh, you're probably familiar with both those places. Christopher Park, to confuse things, has a statue of Sheridan in it. You can talk about that in another lecture. Uh, the stone wall is here uh, on Christopher Street. Here's Waverly Place, the Northern Dispensary, and uh, all of that leading to this, which is the um, station on the the Sixth Avenue elevated train. I'm not quite sure why this next slide, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm like, what's the next slide? Oh yeah, that's the next slide. <laughs> Telling you what the, uh, where the station is. So starting in the late 1860s, but really not getting going until the 1870s, New York City uh, has its first experiment with rapid transit. And that rapid transit is uh, elevated trains, the Ninth Avenue, the Sixth Avenue, the Third Avenue, uh, this is the one that we are concerned with. Blue, it comes down here. It comes up West Broadway to Bleecker. It turns, it heads up. There was a station at 8th Street, 14th Street, and then upwards. So that was the course of the 6th Avenue elevated in Greenwich Village. Lovely painting or illustration from a magazine showing it running in front of Jefferson Market Courthouse. Uh, here's a photograph many years later of the same thing. There's a CO Bigelow uh, right here, which is still in business. Uh, so the Sixth Avenue elevated, this is a, a John Sloan painting. So the, uh, the Sixth Avenue elevated brought people into the village, took people away from the village. It made the village accessible, but it also in some ways cut the village into two portions. Now these two portions already existed. There was west of 6th Avenue, which was the older part of the village with those streets that don't quite make sense. And then there was the east side of uh, 6th Avenue, which is the grid and Washington Square and all those things. So uh, it's not like those things didn't exist, but the 6th Avenue L kind of exacerbated the issue. Um, what you end up with west of 6th Avenue, we start to get this kind of concentration of bohemianism. Uh, so we have the very famous Pirate's Cave and the Ink Pot. These are all on Sheridan Square. These are photos by Jesse Tarbox Beals, who is this incredible chronicler of the village in the years before the subway. Uh, so late 19th century, but really the decade, say between 1900 and 1910, is what she captured on film. And they're amazing photographs that really show you, give you an insight into what was drawing people to the village. I love this picture of the village art gallery and the tea room uh, with them set up outside this particular version of the picture doesn't have her hand-drawn captions on it, um, but she often captioned these photos. Um, this is a, the same Sheridan Square showing the horse-drawn carriage, the one that was, uh, the horse-drawn trolley, sorry, the one that was so convenient to the Voorhees. There it is going down Washington Place. This is inside one of the shops. 
So uh, if you lived in the Voorhees, um, and just to show you, this is Sheridan Square, and here's the Voorhees. So if you lived in this building, you were mere steps away from the kind of center of the Bohemian community in Greenwich Village, which was the center of the Bohemian community in America. Uh, so it was really quite an interesting building, and I tried to find out who lived there, uh, and, and there's not a lot going on. I mean, you look at newspaper accounts, and you get um, this one, which is talking about a guy named Lawrence McQuaid, another guy named Arthur McGuff, uh, getting arrested for beating up the janitor who worked at 210 West 4th Street. Evidently, he went outside and said, stop making a racket, and they beat him up. Um, you have this gentleman named Fabian F. Lafabor at 210 West 4th Street, um, being one of the many people writing in 1896 to the board of uh, aldermen of New York City and asking them to take that little triangle of land and either name it after Sheridan or Farragut. Uh, Admiral Farragut uh, lost out in this case. And so William Henry Sheridan gets his square that same year. Um, uh, we have another newspaper article from a few years later talking about a man uh, named James Watson of 210 West 4th Street who ran an illegal pool hall over on uh, 8th Street near Broadway. Uh, and we have, this is absolutely fascinating, uh, a, an ad for a book by Lita A. Churchill called A Grain of Madness, which I wasn't uh, thinking I was going to be interested in and then started reading. And now it's fascinating and I want to read the whole book. It's available on Google Books if you're looking for um, a, a interesting book. But I started reading it before I realized that she's an incredibly uh, forgotten and important figure in American literature because she started writing in the, I want to say, 1870s um, about men and women who were interested in same-sex relationships. And this was 100% taboo. Uh, it is assumed that she was gay herself. And the fact that she lived at the Voorhees, a, a literal stone's throw uh, from Stonewall, uh, is kind of amazing and or not so amazing because this is the exact same era that other gay writers like Willa Cather are moving to Greenwich Village. There was obviously a community in Greenwich Village. And so... Um, I guess what we should say is that it's not surprising that the stone wall ends up being where it is uh, because um, it's right there in the center of what must have been uh, the, the, the sort of heart of the LGBTQ community in Greenwich Village. Uh, all of which was about to come crashing down, boom, with the opening of the subway. So in 1900, the city breaks ground for its first underground railroad. This is a picture of the City Hall station, uh, now closed, which was the kind of crown jewel of the whole thing. And what the city decides to do is run a subway from City Hall. It runs up the east side to 42nd Street to Grand Central. It makes a jog over to Times Square, and then it runs up the uh, west side. Uh, I often say it re resembles an S. Uh, the city actually uh, often referred to it as looking like a Z. And it was not a city project. It was contract number one was with a company uh, called Inter Interborough Rapid Transit, run by a guy named Augusta Belmont, and it was a private concern. Um, and the, one of the reasons it was a private concern is the city was not 100% sure that this was going to be a, uh, a success. Are people really going to want to ride around in a hole in the ground? Uh, but it then turns out to be a great success. And as this letter writer to the New York Times says, uh, just a few years after the IRT opens, the success of the subway has shown to New York the solution of the rapid transit problem, and it is to be hoped that no time will be lost in underlaying the entire city with this means of transportation. And I'm here to tell you, no time was lost. Uh, the IRT immediately begins expanding the what would later become the BMT, but is then the BRT, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, uh, begins laying track in Brooklyn. 
And um, this idea comes about uh, that we refer to today as dual contracts. That's not really important to the story, but what it means is that a lot of money is being poured into building the subway including by the city. The city is willing to take on some of the risk for building a new subway system while it will still be operated by private companies. The city will come to rue this decision later. Um, but what it means is starting in about 1910, rapid expansion of the subway system. And if you look at this map of the Interborough Rapid Transit uh, from the 1930s and we zoom in, you can see that here is still that uh, elevated train line uh, running through the village, but now we also have a subway which has a stop at Christopher Street slash Sheridan Square. Well, that's all well and good, except that 7th Avenue stops at 11th Street. Uh, there was no street south of that point. So for them to build a subway uh, using their traditional method, which is known as cut and cover, they first needed to build a street. And as this article from the New York Times, uh, I think this is 1911, notes, the 7th Avenue extension will create great business revival in old Greenwich. Um, it's interesting how many articles from this era still refer to the neighborhood just as Greenwich. Um, uh, actual work in making a new west side 100-foot thoroughfare to begin next year will mean the end of St. John's Chapel. Uh, so they're quite concerned about uh, the number of landmarks that will be uh, torn down south of Greenwich Village. Uh, but what the city is really looking for here is a connection to the brand new Penn Station. And so um, they're willing to use their right of eminent domain to take these properties so that they can uh, they can get the, the the subway is more important than the history. So I said that Seventh uh, Avenue stopped at Eleventh Street. Here is that happening. This is Seventh Avenue, and this is Greenwich Avenue running in a diagonal, and this is Eleventh Street over here. And boom, that's it. The Monahans Express Company Depot and everything else was going to have to come down and. The wreckers were busy in Greenwich Village. Uh, it notes here that the scores of old buildings coming down, uh, Bedford Street Church a ruin. So what they're concerned about in this story is the Bedford Street Methodist, they call it Methodist, it was a Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which was in the way and which the congregation had to leave and it was torn down. Um, and they also take the time to point out one of the largest buildings to go will be the seven-story flat occupying the small block front on West 4th Street between Grove and Christopher Streets overlooking Grove Street Park. Grove Street Park is um, uh, Christopher Park. Uh, so this was one of the best of the early apartment houses in that locality. So obviously the writer for the New York Times thinks that the Voorhees is a is a nice building they take the time i mean hundreds of buildings are going to get destroyed in this but they take the time to pull out the Voorhees. and um so when you search for this online that i'm not going to say who this is but this is just a typical um thing that you find about this uh one of the raised buildings a five-story seven-story apartment building called the Voorhees, belonged to david hess he fought the city in hopes of saving this building, but by 1914, all that remained of his property was a small triangle of sidewalk. The city assumed Hess would donate the tiny tract to, uh, to the public sidewalk, but they were wrong. He took the city to court and was allowed to retain ownership of his prized triangle. So here's what's wrong with this. I mean, I keep pointing this out, but it is said over and over again that it was a five-story apartment building, but every single uh, mention of it in the press, calls it a seven-story building, uh, so I'm going to call it a seven-story building. Um, he fought the city in hopes of saving his building. There is absolutely no record of the Hess estate uh, fighting the city. And first of all, it's the Hess estate. David Hess died in 1907. So all of his property, and he was a huge real estate investor. He owned property in New Jersey, in Washington, D.C., in Philadelphia, where he was from, and in New York. Uh, all of that went to his heirs. 
So everything that's happening here is not David Hess. It is the Hess estate, which is why that's what it says in the triangle. Uh, but I have searched the surrogate's court records. I have searched the appellate court records. I have searched the Supreme Court records. I have searched them in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. And I have not come up with a single instance of the Hess estate fighting to save this building. Uh, in fact, it seems illogical to me that they would have uh, fought because they were probably being paid uh, a pretty penny for it. I mean, yes, right of eminent domain uh, is not always the thing that works out for, for landowners, but in this case, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of people saying to the city of New York during this era, uh, I'm going to fight you tooth and nail. And I think that this story has emerged over time because why else would there be the piece of land? Uh, if it wasn't if, if it wasn't the, the the remnant, if it wasn't the only thing left of this fight, why would there be this mosaic? But as far as I can tell, no fight. Uh, so it says he took the city to court and was allowed to retain ownership. Again, no court records. I find no example of him taking the city to court. What seems to have happened is that Seventh Avenue was measured quite precisely uh, as to where they wanted it to go. Here's a wonderful picture looking north from uh, Morton Street at the destruction of uh, Greenwich Village for, for the building of the subway. Uh, and a little piece of the Voorhees uh, didn't fit. It wasn't part of what they needed. And whether it was an error or it was deliberate is unclear, but it seems like they just didn't need that piece of land. And so the surveyors did what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to draw a line straight line up and down both sides of where 7th Avenue South was going to run. That little piece of land didn't need to be part of it, and so it wasn't part of it. So just to orient you, this is Bleecker Street here, and we know that because these three buildings, boom, 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 still stand on Bleecker Street. So this is them, the three buildings on Bleecker Street, and somewhere up here, just outside the focus of this, is uh, is our corner. And it's really annoying that this picture was not taken a little bit closer. But one thing that I want to point out is that they talk about how the, the Voorhees was unusual. Uh, it, it's seven stories tall, one of the tallest, one of the oldest, one of the best. But clearly there were other tall buildings in the neighborhood. I mean, this seems like it's a pretty tall building that must have been torn down. Uh, even these ones on Bleecker Street, this is one, two, three, four, five. That's six stories tall. So seven stories was not all that unusual. So I got really excited when I found this picture, which purports to be a building having been halfway torn down at Grove and Christopher Street. And I'm like, that's got to be our building. Um, and maybe, maybe it is. There is a chance that you are looking at the back of the Voorhees. I'm pretty sure we're looking at the backs of buildings here because this looks like the back of this house, not the front of it. But while a small portion is cut off by the construction fence here, that is a door, not a window, which means that is at the very least the second story of a building is probably the first story of a two-story building. Uh, and so that would make this one, two, three, four, five. I suppose there's a chance that the Voorhees was only five stories, but I bet it was seven. So, um, so this isn't the Voorhees, but this is absolutely fascinating that they have just shorn off the part of the building that they needed to take down and have not, in this picture, taken down anything else. But that's not even the most fascinating part. Because once you start to zoom in, there's a guy sitting there. Zoom in again. There he is, wearing his hat, reading his paper. Um, I, I, I cannot believe uh, in the midst of this that there's someone just sitting there in his house. Uh, but hey, why not? So probably not the Voorhees, but definitely, we'll just zoom out so you can see it one more time, but definitely one of the buildings knocked down and certainly the most incredible picture. This is, uh, I believe, at the New York Historical Society, this photo uh, that I have seen of this subway construction. So if nothing else, I found this picture and it makes me happy. Boo. Hi there. 
So what do we know? We know we have this article from July 27th, 1922 from the New York Times uh, reporting on the mosaic being put in place. We have an article from the Real Estate Record and Guide. Um, that is a, an invaluable resource to people doing research into late 19th, early 20th century um, uh, real estate in New York City. And I find it interesting that no matter how many different ways I looked, uh, the only uh, thing that I found about David M. Hess was this, that the smallest assessed parcel, lot 55, block 591, um, uh, is 24 by 26 inches, owned by the estate of David M. Hess, they get his initial right, of Philadelphia, assessed at $100. Its existence came to general knowledge when a crowd observed workmen laying the tile. So, um, here's a uh, story in a magazine called the Strauss Investors Magazine. And this is the most, also from 1922, so the same year, 100 years ago, that the tile was laid. And this comes the closest to sort of investigative reporting uh, that I have found anywhere. A short time ago, the smallest piece of real estate in New York City was accidentally discovered and claimed by its Philadelphia proprietors. The lot is a small triangle, 25 by 26 inches, eh, or whatever, directly in front of the door of a tobacco shop at 7th Avenue and Christopher Street. So, I just find that's very interesting. This is 1922. That Village Cigars tobacconist has been a tobacconist for a hundred years. We should be celebrating that too. Um, workmen have placed the following inscription, property of the Hess estate, etc. It followed as a matter of course that many curious people began to wonder and to ask who and what the Hess estate was and where it had acquired such a queer parcel of valuable real estate. David M. Hess of Philadelphia is the owner and records show that this tiny triangle became detached from a corner lot of which it was originally a part through an error made by surveyors when the street was being widened. Some time ago, the Hess estate was called upon to pay accumulated taxes. So it was discovered because it was being taxed and the persons concerned issued a prompt denial of ownership of any such lot. They were interested enough, however, to come to New York, and there they saw a plot of land scarcely large enough for the base of a penny-in-the-slot machine, but strategically located directly in front door of the tobacco merchant's establishment. Negotiations resulted in a lease of this lot to the cigar dealer, which specified that the plot should be marked so that the city might know it had not been dedicated to the use of the public. If this has not been done, the city in time could have claimed it. So what this is saying is that the Hess heirs, if they're going to pay taxes on this, they're going to keep it a piece of private land. And if they are going to lease it to the cigar store, they can't make money from that lease if it is claimed by the public. So it is not, as you sometimes read, a mosaic that is a piece of spite. It is not a mosaic that is put in place so that um, they can shake their fist at the city having lost or won or whatever in court. It is, in fact, them putting this down so that they can say, hey, we own this on, um, we own this piece of land and we're going to lease this piece of land and you're not going to take this piece, you're not going to take our valuable 24 inches of land away from us. So we're going to put a marker down and because they are you know, nice people, they put a nice marker down. So uh, I think this is kind of a funny story. Workmen left a barrel of rubbish standing on it because there was a complaint that you're not allowed to leave rubbish on a public sidewalk. So they moved it onto the mosaic and then it's like, eh, it's on private land. You can't ticket us. So this is a picture from above. This is the Greenwich Village Theater, which used to stand on the opposite corner, looking south down 7th Avenue South. And I just wanted to end uh, by talking about um, uh, talking about this, the way Seventh Avenue South changed this neighborhood. So this is uh, West Fourth Street over here. Grove Street comes in over here. This is technically Grove over here, and this is Seventh Avenue South. And so this is a great example. This building. You can see it takes an angle because 7th Avenue South takes an angle, but presumably this building used to run in that direction. 
and they had to shear it off, and then they capped it. And other buildings just were knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, and little garages and other things were put in. Uh, this is the coffee pot up at, uh, I think this is West 4th Street. That's what it looks like today. This little piece of land put a little piece of building on a little piece of land. Um, but what I found most interesting collecting these slides is, notice that this is an ad for Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil. The whole point of 7th Avenue South was so that the subway could be built underneath it. But what it engendered, what it brought about, was in fact more and more places for cars. Here's Commerce Street uh, with an ad for the Cherry Lane Theater. Uh, and what they've tucked into their little corner is a mobile filling station. And here is, uh, I'm not 100% sure which where this is, but this is Municipal Gasoline Station. And here's Kesbeck Gasoline Station. And these are all just uh, ways to take advantage of the way that the city uh, carved up this street. Now, all of these gasoline stations are now gone, uh, but I just find it fascinating that the way that industry and commerce decided to take advantage of the subway being built was to in fact make it easier for cars. Uh, and that then of course come, becomes this big issue uh, in New York City, uh, starting in the 1930s and moving onward about whose city is it? Is it a city of public transit or is it a city of private transit? And that's a topic for another day. But we'll just finish with that same book we started with that talks about the Hess Triangle. Perfectly good little summary. Uh, that summary actually comes from a children's book called Samantha Spinner and the Boy in the Ball. And it is revealed when you turn the page uh, that there is a three-way switch beneath the Hess Triangle that is a secret control for an ultra-high-speed slingshot trolley stationed beneath Cleopatra's Needle in Central Park. This must be true, right? It's in a book. Tapping one of the three special tiles will point the vehicle towards either A, the Library of Congress, B, the wreck of the RMS Titanic, or C, an empty field in Dynamite, a suburb of Spokane, Washington. Oh my god, I've tapped it. Oh no. There we go. Welcome to Dynamite, folks. So thanks. I'm going to look at the questions uh, and see if there's anything that I can answer. Thank you so much for joining me today. I would love for you to join me on a future talk. Um, these are the three that are coming up. I draw special attention to Thursday, August 11th, when uh, I'll be doing a talk called Escape from New York in conjunction with Village Preservation. Uh, 1822 is the year of the yellow fever outbreak. So the Hess Triangle was 100 years ago. Uh, and it, uh, 200 years ago is when Greenwich Village made a massive, nearly overnight shift from being bucolic, uh, suburbia to, or outright countryside to being a major part of New York City. And so we're going to talk about how and why that happened. The pandemic, epidemic, whatever you want to call it, that swept through lower Manhattan and drove people. So please go to walknyc.com if you want to sign up for that. Prior to that, uh, on Tuesday, July 12th, uh, on the 284th anniversary of New York being shelled by the British, uh, we're going to talk about how New York got itself into and then tried to get itself out of the American Revolution. And on Thursday, July 28th, uh, we'll take a trip, a virtual trip to the beach and do a history of Coney Island. And all the details of these talks are available on our website at walknyc.com. So, do you agree that the triangle results, results from a surveyor's error? Um, or do you think it fell outside? I don't think it was an error. I think that the surveyors were doing what they were told to do. Uh, and the fact that that piece of land was not part of the survey uh, was not their problem. You know, so they just did the... Uh, they just did. Oh, they just did what they were told to do, and that's that. Who maintains the mosaic, and why did the Triangle Store want to lease it? Uh, they wanted to lease it because it was their front door, and um, I think that if everything had gone according to what the city's plan would have been, that piece of land would have been absorbed into the lot 
on which the triangle was built. And in fact, today it is owned by them. So it was leased from 1922 until about 1933. Um, don't quote me on that. It might have been as late as 1938. Um, and then it was sold outright. So now the cigar store owns that lot. Uh, and so uh, it is all part. Uh, the gas station building on the right in the photo is still there and landmarked. Yes, a number of these buildings are still there uh, that were gas stations. Uh, they just are not uh, gas stations anymore. I don't think there are any gas stations on 7th Avenue South. There used to be a Luke Oil over the Soviet, uh, Russian, sorry, uh, I'm dating myself, the Russian one over on 9th Avenue, but I don't know what happened to that. Once the city realized a triangle remained with the Hesses, they could no longer use the argument of eminent domain uh, because it wasn't necessarily acquired. Yes, I think that's exactly right. It wasn't necessary for the city to acquire it, so they didn't bother to even try. Uh, they just simply taxed it. And as another researcher has figured out, while the triangle is about 24 by 26 inches, uh, it seems like if you look at the lot itself, uh, you like zoom into the photographs, it might have been more like about six or seven feet on a side, the triangle. Uh, and so while the mosaic is cute, um, it may also have been bigger. Did Hess have any other New York City property? Yes, he definitely did have property that he sold while he was alive. I've seen records of him selling downtown buildings, uh, but New York was absolutely not the main place. He owned a lot of property where he lived in Pennsylvania. He lived in Philadelphia. Um, he was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, so he owned a lot of property there. I, I only know that he owned property in Washington, D.C. and New Jersey because of lawsuits. And so one of the reasons why I think there wasn't a lawsuit involved in this property is his name does come up in lawsuits. Tenants uh, sue the estate. Uh, after he dies for various things. And so it's not like this would was unusual. And so what's unusual is that it doesn't sh that it doesn't show up in New York. Uh, I really think that it would if such a lawsuit actually existed. Um, who maintains the triangle now? I assume the, the triangle is maintained by Village Cigar. Is it protected? Um, I honestly, it's in the it's in the historic district. I have to assume that it is uh, offered some protection, though it is not as well maintained as it could be. I mean, when you look at it, uh, you can see that it has uh, it has definitely seen better days. Uh, someone's asking me if I've ever seen Voorhees spelled that way: V O O R H I S. The most common way that it is spelled is V-O-O-R-H-E-E-S. Uh, it's an old Dutch family, uh, but in fact, that was a pretty common spelling at the time, and the John Voorhees, who was the head of Tammany Hall in the same era, uh, spelled his name that way. Um, it's uh, The two E's is the more common spelling, but the H-I-S is not, is not that unusual. And uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, dig into the Hess Triangle, and I appreciate that so many people uh, were able to be here today. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.